Okay, we have five minutes past. So if you're happy, Helena, I can start the introduction. So I'm assuming already that everyone can hear us. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'm Laura and I work with Helena at Local Futures. Um, just before we begin, uh, a few admin things. Um, you are all automatically on mute, but you can unmute yourselves in the bottom. Um, just to save any background noise during the chat, we'll ask you to stay on mute, but there'll be a chance for us all to join in the discussion during this webinar so you can unmute yourselves and we can all have a chat then. I know that some of you may not be able to stay for the full two hours, so we just wanted to let you know about the next step after this webinar, which is joining the International Alliance of Localization, which was set up by Helena's organization, Local Futures, in 2014. And it now has over 900 members in 58 different countries. And it's a cross-cultural network of thinkers, activists, NGOs, organizations, communities, anyone interested in localizing and wanting to connect with others doing so around the world. It's a perfect place to carry on this discussion after the webinar. You can easily sign up on the Local Futures website. If you just go to the top menu on our projects under Going Local, you'll see a link there. And then once you're signed up, you will gain access to our Facebook group and a email list serve as well, where you can all keep chatting with each other. And we're just about to launch a video project called What Local Means to Me with the IAL. And it would be wonderful if I could ask some of you to, after this webinar, put together a two minute video. It doesn't need to look very professional. It could be on a phone or a camera or a laptop um, of what local means to you. And then once you're a member of the IAL, you can share those in the Facebook group on on the listserv. And the plan at the end of the project is to make one big video with all the different small ones we have. So now I'm going to hand over to Helena, who's going to be throughout this webinar exploring how we can all be part of the transition towards a future that places human and ecological well-being front and centre. Obviously, during this rather scary time and after coronavirus passes. Uh, so Helena is going to start with introducing big picture activism and why it's so important to embrace global to local. Thank you, Laura, and thanks for organizing all of this. And thank you all. I saw some of your names and saw how wide and far apart you are all across the world. And it is so lovely to feel part of a global community. And many people who haven't investigated closely enough uh, into what we mean by localization sometimes think that it's somehow putting blinders on and just going very, very local. Now, we have forever, and forever is now more than four decades, we've been promoting this shift from global to local as an economic shift, where we shift towards supporting and being dependent on smaller, more human scale structures, particularly the economic structures. And that in no way means retreating from the world and it especially is not going to be possible as a real structural path to genuine human and ecological well-being if we don't collaborate if we don't build up a movement big enough you know within our countries but much stronger and more aware if it's also across many of the boundaries that prevent us from seeing what's happening in other countries. So it's actually really important from our point of view to have this very big picture. And the big picture for us is understanding that the same global economic system is pushing individuals, communities, societies, and governments in a direction that has become extremely dangerous and um, we see it as happening primarily because almost no one is actually stepping back to look at the big picture to see what's happening and instead what's happening is that people are tending in terms of the mainstream media to be locked into a, a rather narrow often left-right political debate or 
more and more now into single issue concerns, all of which are very valid, but unfortunately, they're ending up keeping people locked into sort of ghettos that become antagonistic. So, you know, whether it's between, you know, environmental issues versus concern about poverty and livelihoods, or whether it's around whether we eat meat or not, or whether it's around, well, you know, gender, you know, sort of male versus female, we have to be really careful that our particular concern doesn't prevent us from linking voices. We don't have to link hands into one united, somehow one organization. We'd love you to join our Alliance for Localization, but really more importantly is we would love more people to be clear about which direction they want to support forward. Forward after the pandemic, but actually starting now, there's an opportunity for those who have the time to just sit back and think about, the, you know, the question is really, it seems like things are going very wrong in our world. Many of us have lost faith in our government. Many have lost faith in human nature, which is absolutely tragic. And the question that we would want people to explore together is what can we do to make the world a better place for ourselves, for our families, our children, and for the world? We know that we all want clean water. We want healthy, unpolluted food. We want fresh food. Most people would want to support their local farmers. But what's happened, you know, why is it that local food everywhere in the world now, you will find that local food from a mile away will generally cost more than food from 10,000 miles away. So what, what's going on? How does that contribute to climate change? What is the reason why we haven't made more progress in terms of dealing with climate change? So these are many of the issues that we need to look at as part of this big picture activism. I want to stress too that the big picture is really helpful uh, in the sense that when we don't see that bigger picture, there's a tendency for people to blame themselves far, far too much. And it's because there's a sort of dominant narrative out there that's saying, particularly now, it's saying, you know, you were told about climate change, you were informed, and yet you didn't change your lifestyle. You were just too greedy, you wanted to hold on to your lifestyle, you wanted to hold on to your things. Um, and thanks to you, the world is going to hell. Uh, this is a very, very false narrative. It's not giving us the full picture. It's actually not giving us the information that we need. We're told now, even in environmental circles, that information doesn't help. People don't learn from information. It's a very common narrative right now. What that neglects to look at is the fact that the information that would have been very helpful in terms of figuring out how to rapidly systemically reduce emissions. That has far more to do with what was happening to production, to industry. It has far more to do with the fact that in this last 30 years that we've been discussing climate, at that same, in that same period, with the help of our governments, giant global businesses that own our seeds, that own our pharmaceutical supplies that are, are beginning to own the whole world. These giants have been lobbying our governments to give them freedom to do as they like, to go in and out of any and every economy. And what's been happening in the last 30 years is that they have massively increased their ecological footprint and with it, our ecological footprint. But we didn't ask for that. It was not driven by consumers. We were in fact 
not only not asked, but we weren't informed because tragically both left and right went along with this idea, this mantra that free trade, freeing up trade globally is in everybody's interest. Now, most people, you know, tell us, well, Helena, we know all this. We, you know, why are you talking about this? We know all this. There's no point, no point talking about it. What are we going to do? And um, we believe that it is important to have a bit more clarity about how it is that almost every serious crisis we're facing is actually connected to this global economic transition that's been going on. And it is a transition that most people did not know about. They have a sense that big business has too much power. People know that these giants don't pay tax usually, and that's a problem. But the actual path whereby year by year over the last 30 years, as we were all talking about climate change, the gigantic, enormous steps, the collective steps that meant that you and I ended up using far, far more energy without even knowing how or why. Those giant steps were not being discussed. So we actually see that once we, you know, we understand better what's going on, once we understand also that the main reason this is happening is blindness. It's blindness from the grassroots up to the highest echelons of power. I mean, I have been talking to, you know, top economists from the World Bank, from the IMF, um, and it's so clear that they are so locked into numbers and assumptions on a piece of paper that they are literally not sitting down and looking at things the way we have been in our network, on the ground, beginning to ask, well, how can it be? That's something that's been transported for 10,000 miles and costs less than something that's been transported one mile. And it's the same product, butter or, or apples. So how is that possible? And as we started seeing this, we realized that this assumption about efficiency of scale, assumption that ever more global trade is how we're going to grow the economy, which most of our political leaders believe uh, has simply been wrong. What's been happening in every country is that the gap between rich and poor has become bigger and bigger and bigger, obscenely bigger. Most people are aware of that, but they haven't looked at the structural reasons why. Most importantly, um, as part of big picture activism, is to inform ourselves also about what is happening at the grassroots. Seeking out the sources of information, the sources of, you know, real grounded, um, you know, projects, initiatives, individuals that are happening. That's what we call a worldwide localization movement. Because we've had our ears so close to the ground for so long, we find, you know, every day, greater inspiration. Now, in this pandemic, uh, we are, you know, extremely worried and very saddened for people who have lost loved ones and, of course, for people who have lost livelihoods. But what we're seeing is that this pandemic has also led to quite a leap in awareness about the fragility of the global system and about the security and the, the knowledge and the accurate information that people feel they can get from more local businesses and particularly when it comes to food. So there's been this huge increase in awareness about the problems and the fragility of the global system and a huge leap in appreciation of and interest in the local economy, essentially. Now, many people, when you talk about food, they don't really think of farming as the economy. For us, this is one of the most important areas to look at. So as a big picture activist, 
one of the first areas to examine, to understand what's going on in the world that's very concrete, that's very, very clear, is to understand the food system. On the one hand, the global food system, which is an interlinked madness of importing and exporting the same product. We literally make out milk in, and we're talking about thousands of miles. We're talking about the US exporting billion tons of beef and turning around importing billion tons of beef. We're talking about you know, the, the Australia exporting wheat to England and importing wheat from France. We're talking about madness of, you know, wheat, butter, milk, beef being exported and imported in almost identical quantities. Now, one of the first systemic, enormous steps to reduce CO2 emissions and with it lots of uh, methane and so on as well, because the animal factories are part of this gigantic global game of trade. So in terms of ending the animal factories, in terms of massively reducing emissions, restoring health to soil, shifting away from this game of giants and, and playing uh, just a mad game, all in the name of a type of growth which is actually growing the wealth for fewer and fewer individuals and fewer and fewer giant corporations. And all the time, this giant um, game is leading to job insecurity. So even if you're the head of Exxon, you were threatened because you knew there was going to be a merger and you're running faster and faster. And then when Exxon and Mobile join, there's only one CEO. Previously, there were two. So, People are chasing their tail in the name of growth, in the name of GDP, in the name of global trade. In order to become a big picture activist, you don't have to study economics. You don't have to uh, go into great data, but it's very helpful to study some of these basic truths about what's happening, basic principles, and to see that it would make a lot of sense instead of this craziness to start strengthening local economies, starting with food. Food, the only thing that everyone needs every single day to have our governments separate us further and further from the source of our food. As I said, it's one of the biggest causes of climate change. Packaging, plastic, refrigeration, masses of environmental problem. Shortening the distance actually creates markets, plural, that encourage, actually pressure farmers and growers to diversify. So key elements in a systemic understanding as a big picture activist is to not just talk about regenerative agriculture or just agroecological production or just biodynamic or just organic, but to actually understand we need to be systemic in our thinking if we want to move rapidly in a direction that solves many problems simultaneously. So, so we're talking about more localized systems that stimulate and pressure towards diversity on the land. And you know we hear a lot of talk about biodiversity but we're not hearing enough about the understanding that the most fundamental and largest impact of all that we could immediately embrace would be to look at food and farming and to stimulate the creation of a more localized food system. Now that is happening. It's happening from the ground up and I'm particularly thrilled to see how much has happened, particularly in the last 10 years or so. Well, actually even 20 years. When I first came to Australia, there was really no local food movement. And I actually helped to pioneer it. And I was told in the beginning, no, oh, no, you don't understand Australia. It's not going to happen here. And I'm still hearing the same message in many parts of the world where, where they don't know that but actually it is happening. Because part of what's said is, oh, no, no, people want their strawberries in winter and you know, the consumers are not going to let this happen. This is part of a false narrative that as big picture activists, we have to see through. And 
what's really so inspiring about being in touch with the worldwide localization movement is that we get all this evidence, we get all this good news, we keep hearing about more and more things happening. They're small and they're not acknowledged in the media, they're not acknowledged in academia. So most people don't know about them. Even most environmental activists don't know about them. And, um, and unfortunately, many people in the environmental movement don't necessarily see the central importance of food and farming in terms of shifting all of these toxic chemicals, the, you know, the impact on climate, so they don't focus enough on food and farming from our point of view. So anyway, what we're seeing now is this huge upsurge during the pandemic that people are, you know, everywhere buying up the seedlings and the seeds and even you know, uh, you know, people who've never grown anything before are getting on the web and getting permaculture courses on the web. They're, you know, suddenly also discovering the joy of growing things, discovering the benefits of doing this also as part of the homeschooling. So there is a, a lot of hope that once we get out of this pandemic, that we will be heading in this direction towards reconnection with community, reconnection with the earth. Fundamentally, localizing economic activity leads exactly to that, to that deeper interdependence between people and also to a much deeper connection to the living earth that is our economy, that is our, our mother, you know, the, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the soil, we're learning more about the, the biomes and the bacteria in our gut and the bacteria in the soil. We're hearing stories every day coming from neuroscience and from every avenue reminding us that we are part of the earth. So localizing is the path that can allow us to structurally move towards living in a way where we are connected, where we feel that connection. Because it takes us closer to the living earth and to the water and to the trees on which we depend, it also creates a greater sense of responsibility and accountability. It's a prerequisite for genuine democracy. Now, all of that, I don't want to assume that you'll go along with and you know my just saying so but i really hope that you'll be interested in pursuing this avenue of thought and this clarity about on the one hand the global path which has been as i say uh, led primarily because of these trade treaties that have taken um that have given giant businesses more and more freedom but it's a path that fundamentally takes us further away from nature because it's absolutely structurally linked to continued urbanization to the degree that really well-intentioned people, like an expert in the UK the other day named Tim Learning, he announces, comes up with a big report, reporting to the treasury that Farming only contributes 1% to GDP. So let's stop farming. Why are we farming? That's crazy. That's wasteful. Let's be like Singapore and import all our food. Now this is said by sane, intelligent, well-intentioned people, but people that are so lost in their specialized, over-intellectualized tunnels that they seriously recommend this. I mean, I have to tell you also that James Lovelock, who's a lovely man, for those of you who don't know him, he was the sort of first preeminent scientist to, to warn us about climate change. But even at that time, he was also advocating for synthetic food because he felt agriculture was contributing so disastrously to climate change. And because he had no knowledge that in many parts of the world, and I hope in Australia you've heard, including the elders in this country, they were actually managing land, they were actually farming for tens of thousands of years. 
and there are many examples in Asia. This is a very important part of the dominant narrative to change this story, which has been telling us for a long, long time that, oh, the minute we started farming, everything went wrong. That's when humanity just started destroying the earth. This is not true. And it keeps us running and keeps us imprisoned in the madness that now means that a lot of people will go along with the idea of 100% urbanization. And many people will go along with the idea that we should either be importing all our food from somewhere where these invisible slaves are going to grow it for us, and we're not thinking about the transport and the energy and the packaging, or we're going to just create it synthetically in laboratories. Now, I believe that most of humanity today, when asked if they would like to see a shift in policy to support localized food systems, to support a better balance between urban and rural, to support the, the young people who are in small numbers, but increasing numbers like this, who are discovering that they actually love being part of producing food when it is linked to these more localized systems because that means they're not working in a giant monoculture surrounded by noisy machinery. They are actually working on smaller farms, highly diversified and with many people, community around them. Every day the work is different and the joy of working with healthy soil and healthy uh, production and very often having contact with the consumers who appreciate the food is something that is perhaps one of the most enjoyable livelihoods available to us. So it's not that no one wants to farm. No, no one wants to be a migrant laborer and in a giant monoculture. And a final thing I want to say about food, I'll probably come back to food because food is so central. It is so important. It is the biggest area, the, the thing we need to focus on, first of all, to understand what's going on and to understand why so many things have gone so wrong, but also to make the shift towards healthier, genuinely sustainable economies and more enjoyable societies and, and lives. So the other key thing about all of this is the truth is, which we are not hearing, that when it comes to food and farming, fishery, forestry, efficiencies of scale are a complete myth. There is not an efficiency of scale when it comes to the natural world, except that the efficiency is the smaller the better. Obviously not to a ludicrous extreme, but well, actually probably, because if you take any two pieces of land, a square meter or 100,000 square hect you know, hectares, you are going to be able to produce a lot more if you have diversity on one land, piece of land compared to the other. If you have monoculture versus diversification, the diversity will always be able to be more productive, but it requires more people. It requires now, today, the understanding that this techno-economic system pumped up by so-called cheap oil, which was never actually cheap, world wars, etc., etc., pumped up by cheap oil, what was done that was efficient was to liberate people that had sometimes been standing in, literally in, as slaves on huge plantations or later on colonized and in effect slaves. So on these giant monocultures working on the land is pretty dreadful. So bringing the fossil fuels, bringing the machinery looked like progress. And that's why many people embraced it. But now on a crowded planet, we cannot afford to farm in a way that is inefficient, really not productive. And because it destroys the soil, uses up our water, huge subsidies for inefficient farming that destroys the soil, produces unhealthy food, lots of emissions. So, we really must make the shift. Um, and it's happening on a small scale. What we can do as big picture activists is to really help this move forward rapidly. 
And I think right now in this situation of lockdown, we have this sort of pause, you know, people's lives have been sort of you know, being held still. And for many people, that means that they have a little bit more time to think about where we go after the pandemic. Um, I think I'll stop there and take some of the questions. Now I could read some of them, but Laura, you may already have looked enough to pick out. I was going to ask you if you'd seen any that you wanted to a few very interesting ones, or lots of interesting ones, so. Well, I'm just seeing one here. You know, I'm more asking about strategies to bridge the change from small local actions to system. Uh, you know, for example, lots of community gardens don't have the money or people to affect system level change. Very good question uh, from Stephanie. No, that's absolutely true. And you see, this is also why we are talking so much about big picture activism because what we're wanting to encourage is that people do join these small, completely underfunded projects that miraculously have managed to take off because they've taken off because there's this intuitive, I would say, knowledge in our DNA, in our evolution, we evolve closely connected to nature and to others, to intergenerational community. That's in our DNA. As we're cut off from others, pushed into this competitive race, alienated in our high rise living in, in the big cities, we develop a thirst, a longing for reconnection. And I, I want to say more about that later because once you step back and look at it, you'll see there's so much evidence for this. But anyway, we are urging people to actually take that action by either joining or starting one of these small ones virtually on you know what they call it a smell or an oily rag or whatever because there isn't very much money for it at this time but what we're seeing is because because there's a lot of interest and you know you can still help to get something going on very little money and you can probably join something that already exists or support it but the big picture activism comes in precisely because if we're going to make this happen on a much bigger scale, and by that I want to say very clearly, don't fall for the trap of believing that bigger scale means we want all these farms to get bigger. No, we want a multiplication, replication. We want to promote small scale on a large scale. We want to speed up in promoting the understanding that the human race needs to be able to slow down. So we need rapid big picture activism to, for us to realize that if we go down the techno-economic path, which is the global path now towards robots, literally robots, doing the farming, linked to drones, linked to satellites, to monitor carbon, that's being pushed also with the help of the FAO and the UN. Now that is a path that is going to further speed up urbanization, competition, alienation from nature, from community. So we need to really get a clear package, a vision out. Now we need to do that even at the local level. Now at the local level, what's thrilling is that the localization movement has already generated enough momentum. So there are many examples of people coming together to actually raise funds collectively to start some of these initiatives. And in some cases, people are putting in, you know, $50,000 each and creating, in effect, a sort of local bank. In other cases, people are putting in $100 each and helping, you know, one farm to build a shed or helping in their local CSA to make sure that by adding a bit of money, people who, have, who can't afford the local organic food are able to buy it at a lower price. So there are, there are many ways that there are mechanisms where more education, learning about some of the other examples can help to strengthen the local alternatives. There are also many examples of how now, because of this incredible, amazing, 
action on the part of the you know, grassroots, primarily women, by the way. Without a doubt, the leaders in this movement are women. The ones who are actually doing the work, very often the ones who start the initiatives. They are, as we know, not always the leaders of particular organization. Although I have to say, when it comes to the worldwide local food movement, even in the leadership positions, it's mainly women. So there, um, we're, we're seeing, you know, the, the, um, a lot of examples that can help us strengthen the local alternative. But now we're also seeing that from that, at the level of local government, there are changes. And it's so, it is again for me such evidence about the importance of local. Because what we're seeing is that mayors, even in some big cities, like we work with the mayor of Seoul and we work with the mayor of Bristol and several mayors in Tokyo, actually, yeah, quite a lot of mayors around the world. And, and also local councils, like here in Barashaya now, they're helping to keep the farmers markets open and there's an awareness of their importance. So, the local governments are responding and to the pressure and the pressure includes being closer to what's actually happening on the ground it's having eyes and ears with which to see things once you go up to the higher level of the federal national government they tend to be blind and they're listening to the tune of the money that's pressuring in this very frightening direction so that's where BPA or, Brit or Big Picture Activism is also so important, that we want to build up a chorus of voices that will spell out very clearly to our governments that a little bit like Extinction Rebellion, you know, that we want to be at the table. We want to have, you know, we want to see accountability. We are going to, the social and environmental movements, are going to be at the table to ensure that the policies change at the national level. And that will include a demand to stop this insane trade and the insane trade, which by the way, we made a little film by that name, um, you know, includes this import of, and export of identical products. Among other things right now, it's like the last little example we got was 20 tons of bottled water from the UK to Australia, 20 tons of bottled water from Australia to the UK. How can anyone accept this to continue when we know what we're looking at in terms of climate change? So we, we need to get that information out and we need to have you know, more people talking about it. We need to get more funding to also find more examples, do more research, you know, most people who are either starting these alternatives or who are trying to lobby local governments, you know, there's such limited resources and limited people. So a big part of it is to raise our voices, come together more and come together, not abandoning our single issue concern. You know, those who are deeply concerned about homelessness, poverty and those who are concerned about environmental issues, we can very clearly show that this economic shift we're talking about is essential to solve these problems and that we've got this localization agenda which is about shorter distances between production and consumption, it's about shifting to a multitude of farms, a multitude of businesses and allowing smaller towns and even cities to survive, not having an agenda that is going to, in a, you know, that is heading towards 100% urbanization into megalopolis schools and high-rise cities, high-rise agriculture, hydroponics as part of that. That is a path that is blindly adhering to fundamentalist dogma. Now, sorry, I was so long-winded, but I hope, I hope I helped to answer that question. Do you want me to read out a few of the earlier ones? Yeah. yeah. Um, so we had a question from Paul. Um, he said, corporations obviously bear a huge responsibility for global problems and agree that agriculture and the food system is a major factor. But what, what must be done to reduce the global population to an ecologically sustainable level? 
That is, that's a very good question. I'm, I'm so glad you asked that because there's no doubt that, you know, anyone with their eyes open will see that this world will be better off with fewer people. But please help us get out this message that the absolutely worst thing that we can do on an overcrowded planet is to embrace an economic system which has been pushed by both left and right blindly push towards this urbanization, insane trade, and absolutely fundamentally linked to that, has been pushing consumerism. This is deeply embedded in the modern economy. So we're talking about allowing on a crowded planet a system that ensures that each and every one of us uses up more water, more minerals, more of everything because of the economic system. Now, as it happens, as this fossil fuel system, you know, pushed us away from the land into high rise buildings, away from knowing about what our impact was on the natural world, totally dependent on anonymous structures, anonymous businesses, anonymous activities on the other side of the world that we had no idea what was happening. As that system does that, exponentially, our ecological footprint goes up. When people are as close to the land as you can be, in other words, totally self-reliant, you know, on a plot of land, you know, growing their own food with their own hands, animals, plants, uh, trees, and so on, that can ensure the lowest ecological footprint. But self-reliance has been the enemy of the modern economy from the beginning. And it's not, you know, it's understandable that, you know, a lot of people don't want to be producing everything they need for themselves. And in fact, you know, my experience in traditional, you know, indigenous culture is that actually self-reliance, you know, it's just one family. It was probably never anything that existed traditionally. It's what a lot of hippies tried to do in the 60s and was very, very hard. Traditionally, people worked in bigger groups. And just like we say, you know, it took a village to raise a child, it took a village to raise a barn. It took a village um, to harvest a field. So because they had the right ratio of labor to land, what I experienced was that they worked so much less than we do so much more relaxed, had so much time for celebration, for theater, for music and dance, and relaxed pace. Now, I'm not saying that we necessarily all want to go back to exactly that way of life because they didn't have glass in the windows, even though it was cold in the winter. But it was so clear that if we want to find a balance, there is a middle path. There is a middle path where we could actually have some of those basic comforts without destroying the earth. And you know, right now, because we've allowed the fossil fuels and the machinery to be so blind and so stupid, trampling the soil, turning it into dust, picking all the apples in the middle, only half of them are ripe, and then throwing away even more because they don't fit the supermarket shelves. So we have this blind, stupid system that is so wasteful and so destructive that right now we need more people on the land. We need more people than ever. And I'm not saying that every person now has to become a farmer, but I am saying that we need to be thinking very, very clearly about the restoration of our rivers, of our forests, of our farms, of our fisheries, where more people need to be engaged. We have so wounded the earth, we've so poisoned her, that to tend for every earthworm, to tend for every sapling, every seed, requires eyes and hands and hearts, caring, gentle, touch and nurturing life back to life. Now, I would say the same about our children. We have not understood that part of this industrial progress that we embrace has been far more brutal than, than we understand and that I, you know, there is a, 
you know, all around the world. You know, I see it in China, I see it in Thailand, where Steiner schools are coming in. There's an awareness that the conventional schooling is brutal. It's a type of factory farming of our children. And that factory farming of the children also includes having, you know, 31 year olds and one, you know, nursery school adult. And the whole world is just elbows. When you have multi generational connected people and you have numerous elders with one child, you have a completely different universe. So, actually, right now, in everything we care about, our children, their education, health, even, even in music, I would argue we need more players, we need more people. Why do we want to move towards now having a robot through long distance teaching 10,000 children at once? This is what's being promoted as the way forward. No, we want the opposite. We want to see many, many more teachers for every student. We want to see many more doctors. We want to see many more healers and carers. So I'm not advocating for increasing our population, but I'm saying that if we could understand how massively, with the help of people, we could be reducing our ecological footprint, we could be reducing the wounding of many of us who had grown up in a system where the nuclear family wasn't able to answer our needs as a child. We, you know, in the nuclear family, we're so, uh, we've created, I call it, you know, we've been in the nuclear family lockdown for generations. That lockdown has consisted of us building these thick, thick walls around, you know, one man, one woman, and maybe, you know, two children, maybe some more, but this very, very intense, far too small situation to answer our absolutely enormous need for love and connection, to be seen, to be heard, to be appreciated, and to feel deeply connected in a collaborative way. I experienced even in Spain in the 1980s that there was far more of that fabric still left, even after years of Christian oppression and, and the, Islamic invasions and so on, there was still far more of that connection. But then I saw in the 80s how with the consumer culture coming in, even that was broken off and people pushed into the city where the space becomes small, the grandmother becomes useless, the children are off in an institution. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that we can organize, rebuild extended family, but what I am saying is that in the localization that's already happening, you can see that even at a farmer's market compared to a supermarket, you see more intergenerational connection, more time to exchange and talk, to know each other, to know each other's names, more interdependence being built. And that, that is absolutely essential also for our emotional well-being. I hope that doesn't sound too extreme. I think maybe it does. <laughs> Would you like a few more questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So there was one that Ros sent earlier that said, we have this connectivity, the internet, we need to educate. Oh, wait, sorry. We need to educate now while people are listening. And the question is, how do you get the mouthpieces of the world, the celebrities, politicians, educators, and Steve Jobs to make this their priority? Well, the only way I see is to try to bring out more materials, more films, more books, more conferences. And it's interesting because a lot of people say, well, we don't need any more talking, you know, let's just get on with the action. What we're feeling is that we know that the so-called neoliberal think tanks that were thinking away, talking away, writing books, converting people of their economic agenda, they had think tanks. We in Local Futures consider ourselves as a little bit like a think and do tank. We're very close to the action on the ground that informs our thinking and close to different cultures that also informs our thinking. But we feel there is a huge amount to be done in terms of a, a new narrative, a new story. And that is about talking, it is about filmmaking. 
So any of you who are interested, you can, you know, you can start by just talking to a few groups of friends or colleagues or I was going to say family, but very often the best place to start may not be the family. Um, if there are deep, you know, divisions in your thinking, but there is a lot of work to be done again that we call big picture activism that has to do with precisely how can we get this out and how can we, you know, without being uh, ogres, and we don't do enough of this in local futures, but we actually need PR. We need people who are good at trying to get ideas out and that would try to reach people who do have uh, you know, um, an ability to reach lots of people. Because one of the parts of big picture activism is also born of recognizing that the media is part of this conglomerated, blind global system. So these giant monopolies are also the media monopolies. So it's virtually impossible to get a really honest, clear discussion out we are seeing hopeful signs, there are some now, but what, we're, what we also recognize is that it's still very rare that you will see a clear critique of, we don't want to go down that path, but we do want to embrace a more human scale, human pace, localized future. That, that discussion that actually offers a systemic alternative and that clearly rejects the dominant path. That's very, very rare to find in the, in the media. But I, I hope that some of you will think of creative ways and that uh, we can keep putting the message out. And I have to say, like I said earlier, in the last 10 years, it's such, so clear that more and more people are coming on board and a lot of people I've known who were skeptical about localization, who thought of it as sort of right wing or something, they are coming on board now. So we feel quite optimistic about the potential for change. We're worried about some of the signs now, what might happen because of this pandemic and a further centralization and even a shift towards a type of, uh, you know, frightening, um, almost fascistic trends. But at the same time, the sort of people power and what people want is also emerging. So um, we're definitely at a fork and we need to be clear about what we want to support. Okay, so I read one more question and then we can carry on and then come back to the questions later and try and get yeah. them answered. Yeah. Okay, so there's one from Emma, which is how can we bring indigenous or native food, in brackets, Emma's in Australia, um, into local food production while still respecting the traditional owners and how they have a right to the knowledge and have for 50,000 years, arguably more, managed the land and cultivated the land better than the colonial way we have managed the land. And how we can get that out, the information? Um, how can we bring indigenous native food into local production? Um, yeah. Yeah. The core. Well, it's again to me so much of it again comes back to a type of education you know that there are it's happening all the time you know in australia it's definitely happening more and more of those indigenous foods are coming in and uh, but a lot of it is that people many people don't even know about them they don't even know about them you know huge nutritional benefits the vitamin c content etc etc but it's a process that is happening. And it's, it's again, it's a global trend towards really appreciating the indigenous heirloom varieties and, and also especially appreciating and understanding the wild, how incredibly mineral rich and vitamin rich those, those herbs and plants are, many of which were dismissed as weeds or you know, not even known about. But again, it's, I think, I think we, I just come back again and again to, to this education process that's needed. Okay, and one that I think links nicely onto that as well is, um, sorry, I've lost the name. Um, 
Oh, actually, I don't think it's named so. Um, Helena, I've admired your work for such a long time. As an anthropologist, I often consider the numerous things that indigenous communities can teach us about reconnecting with the environment and learning more about our local foods. How do you think we can incorporate indigenous voices into the large scale activism without dispossessing them of their cultural knowledge? Oh, I think that's a really good question too, because unfortunately there is this idea of cultural appropriation now. And I, I'm working with some indigenous people, in, actually in quite a few countries, who are very, very happy to link hands with any and everyone who wants to really come back to nurturing Mother Earth and nurturing community. It's essentially, again, localization. I, I know there's sometimes I talk about localization as re-indigenization. It's about becoming indigenous again, becoming of place. And of course, that doesn't mean that some, you know, whitey from you know, wherever can suddenly pretend to be an indigenous person. But the desire to re-indigenize, to reduce our ecological footprint, to be closer to the earth, to really be part of community, and to deeply learn from indigenous culture is something that I hope most indigenous leaders will welcome. I have found that very often the skeptical voices are in fact more you know western academics or people who yeah who are looking for um maybe you know who are thinking in terms of rights and uh, you know whether it's standing up for women's rights or, or indigenous rights not looking at how we can work together um, so I, I think we really have to re-examine what's going on in the name of cultural appropriation and be very supportive of those who would critique commercial exploitation, you know, branding and just, you know, picking a few sexy goodies from indigenous culture from those who are genuinely working to, to restore healthier ways of doing things. Shall we come back to more questions in a bit? Would you like to carry on or would you like to continue with some more questions now? Well, I, I just saw that question about the, co the connection between localization and mental well-being. And I, I'd be quite happy to talk about that a bit. Mm -hmm. um, I started talking about the enormous benefits of the multi-generational extended family and I think some people in the West may find that um, you know maybe just you know uh, too idealistic or unrealistic but I want to say very clearly that I know just how difficult it is uh, to bring about those changes so what we encourage and what we see happening in the localization movement is a much deeper consciousness about how much we do need one another and how important it is for us also as parents to help our children have more significant others in their life, not just these extremely over intense relationships in the nuclear family, which because we are not having those emotional needs met, they become it's almost impossible, you know, one husband, one wife, one is a little busy and the other one feels insecure and it's almost impossible to meet each other at exactly the same need, level of need, at exactly the same time. So it's a very unstable structure. What happens when you have much deeper connection, which of course traditionally was literally in the extended family and you know, what I experienced in Ladakh or in Tibet was, you know, aunts and uncles and grandparents and great grandparents. And, you know, so you would have at least three, four generations living together. And what you saw was this amazing wealth of the very oldest and the very youngest just being made for each other. It was just so beautiful to see, you know, both hairless, both toothless, both eating very, very slowly, you know, not able to chew, both 
trying to walk hand in hand, you know, like the old 80 year old uncle with the one year old sort of walking together, you know, barely able to walk. It's just, it was just sort of like a marriage made in heaven. And it really was a situation where, you know, women would give birth when they were biologically young, but so much of the parenting was happening with grandparents and, and you know, great grandparents. So I hope that in the long run, we do come back to that. But for right now, where we are right now, for mental well-being, we feel we have reams of evidence to show how important community building is. That you don't go at it alone and that the really successful therapies that are dealing with deep depression, with anxiety, eating disorders, addiction, suicidal tendencies, these are group efforts. And now the even more sophisticated therapies are incorporating the spiritual element, particularly now the spiritual connection to nature. So actually helping juvenile delinquents come out into a, a, a wilderness or out into nature, learning a few skills and being helped to sit in circle, to share from a deeper place what they're feeling. What are their fears? What are their anxieties? And as people realize that they're not alone in feeling that fear or anxiety, it's a huge gift and relief. And it's a, well, I mean, again, we, we've seen it in traditional cultures that having a, a broader group to share the caring, to share the grief, to share the joy, it's extremely important. And as I say now, in modern societies, the therapies that work are essentially including that broader community effort. Why is it not happening more? It comes back to the economic stranglehold that's making it too expensive for a few adults who are trained in this to take out a group of 10 youth. So it now still tends to be something that is fairly expensive. And the mainstream, what our taxes are subsidizing, this institutionalized approach, of course, doesn't work. So, and of course, you know, with many juvenile delinquents and so on, they just put away. And I've seen um, prison projects, or there's one in particular that is just so lovely, where about 10 prisoners, held by roughly about 10 workers, are allowed to come out of prison to learn how to garden, to learn how to cook together, to sit around the table together, and helped to have a different sort of conversation. And I, you know, to hear a hardened criminal who said he'd been in and out of prison his whole life, that he had never before had a conversation where people were actually interested in what he was feeling. You know, it just, it brings tears to your eyes and it just, tears of joy, you know, that these things are happening. But what we're talking about <clears throat> with this emphasis on an economic shift is also how can we make human beings, human caring, human labor affordable for us. We are actually imprisoned in a system where we've allowed this pretense that oil is cheap and that the mass production of humans and the mass dealing of humans is efficient and we're, <clears throat> we're being fooled into completely artificial values. The money label is not a representation of any real scarcity. It's a political choice. It's what we decide to subsidize, to tax and to regulate. That's how we shape the direction. We, can, we could overnight, now what's happened overnight, Governments suddenly have billions and trillions of dollars to spend in a, in a way that sounds good. It's probably not that good because most of it is as loans. But it's the, you know, the fact is that if we as societies decided to take back the money supply from private global banks and determine how we want to spend money, and that means who's in control of making it, how is it distributed, what are we putting a value on? What do we want to encourage? Overnight, we could be supporting this path 
towards more human beings in the equation, towards local organic being a lot cheaper than food from the other side of the world. But it's the mechanisms that we jointly as a society decide to use. So there's a structural part. It may sound a bit complicated, you know, to suddenly change the whole trading system, but we can nurture and support examples now. But with big picture activism, also make them much more visible and spell out the political part that we want. I hope that makes sense. Thank you, Helena. There's one that I know has been sent a few times um, from Cyprian. So, hi, Helena. It seems to me that what you're wanting to change requires a change of governance, a change of our democratic institutions. Do you think localization means transforming our governance in such a way that local governments get more power and autonomy? Maybe also get their own currency and their own electronic voting systems? Well, that's, that is a good question. I personally am worried about the shift to electronic systems. I see that as a very almost certain step into more centralized control, more essentially taking us further in the direction we don't want to go. We want decentralization, that's synonymous with localization, economic decentralization. The internet and the electronic path is linked to the satellites, is linked to what the military has created and linked to centralized control. So I'm, I'm quite worried about how many people are putting a lot of energy and idealism into cryptocurrencies and thinking that the electronic path is actually going to lead to localization. And I think that's true also with 3D printing. Uh, I think it's unfortunate that um, we're ending up, you know, uh, working in plastic when there's this huge potential for using natural local materials in a multitude of creative ways. And when we step back and examine what we really need and what kind of crafts and arts and so on, I would, you know, I'm really, thinking we should be looking at local natural materials wherever possible. There's a, there's a, a big period of transition, of course, where even fossil fuels are needed and we have plastic, we're going to be using it. But the, the really important part of this is to be looking at <clears throat> which direction, which systemic direction are we helping to move things. And this is where, unfortunately, uh, for instance, recycling plastic and so on, hasn't been part of a systemic shift to reduce the production of plastic. And very often the recycling efforts have simply allowed a mega increase in plastic and a mega increase, again, also in transport. So, you know, even that, you know, plastic waste is exported and imported around the world as well. So, um, yeah, um, I would I would warn about that that focus on electronic currencies, and I would also urge people to focus first on building up local food systems, and then from that look at local business alliances. There are lots of efforts where people you know, love their local shop that was struggling because again, it's employing people and the shift towards more and more electronics made it more and more expensive. And the local community came together and they created a loyalty card and they basically ended up as a local community keeping the shop alive. It's happened also with restaurants that people loved. It happened, um, you know, with farms. So, uh, paying attention to the, all the various aspects of the local food system and then local business alliances, community energy. There are lots of examples of people coming together, putting in small amounts of money and perhaps having their own um, windmill or even um, hydroelectric scheme. Um, so, 
I would say those aspects first, and then maybe once we get enough in place, focusing on shifting the currency could work. But I have to say, we have had now, you know, more than four decades of experience in pioneering and starting localization initiatives around the world. And until now, we are not seeing an example where local currencies are actually working. So neither the electronic version nor when people print their own currency or, or use the internet for something like a let's scheme. What, what we've seen happening is that with that local currency, you can't bring about as much structural change as you can by basically getting producers and consumers together to collaborate, to be interdependent. So even using the national currency, you can change the structure. And then once that really, really grows, we should be able to convert to a local currency. But so far, it hasn't worked anywhere. We started two currencies ourselves from our small office in Berkeley and from our very small office in Vermont, where our main colleague lives and who's also a farmer in Vermont. And we started these local currencies there and they worked for about 10 years. But really, you know, they created a group that collaborated that became more literate about local, but they failed. And I, when I, how long ago was it now? Maybe three, four years ago, I heard that George Ferguson, the mayor of Bristol, had helped to start a local currency. And that people in the city of Bristol, which is quite big, more than 500,000 people, could pay some of their local taxes and so on in the local currency. And I thought, yay, maybe now with that sort of support, the local currency will work. And that scale, no, it's not really working. Don't tell George I said so, he's a, he's a friend. And you know, it's still a bit of an educational tool and it's quite fun but it's not really working. It's, it's not even really, I would say, helping to change those vital structures about you know, how things are being produced and what's being produced. So I would urge people to leave the local currency to later. But what is important, I mentioned earlier, but that's also to see local financing as a very important strategy and to realize that Friends, uh, we are one of our closest colleagues is Michael Schumann, who is probably the world's expert on local finance. And he's been involved with this. He's been one of the earliest economists to take it seriously. And so he's seen various strategies that work. And uh, he's also helping in America to get people's superannuation or pension funds out of the big bad system and to bring it into a, a more localized system. But at, an, at another level, you know, he's helped also to get crowdfunding regulations changed so that you can do quite a lot with crowdfunding in terms of raising money for the local projects and the local system you're trying to support. Thank you, Anna. Just going back to that question in the beginning bit, um, so, Cyprian just sent a follow up, but he wanted more specifically does localization require a change of governance, a change in institutions and the way we vote? Well, localization doesn't require that. In other words, localization is, the, is a path towards a change in governance. So we don't, we, we are, thank God, you know, seeing that people are starting to localize without a change in governance and that is very much self-organized local community groups and you know sometimes you know like i was amazed to see in seoul in south korea you know a city of about 10 million people there is an area called uh some i know i forgot the name some something anyway i was there you know about eight years ago or something and there on the edge of Seoul, there had been a little bit of a park, you know, they don't have much of that left. And they were going to develop that. So local people got together to protect that little hill. 
and park and out of that grew more and more collaboration to protect their environment to protect what they cared about and that led to starting an alternative school they ended up having people like even a dentist who treated me for free because they love my book and they they had you know their dentists and doctors and shops and a school and by the time i was there there were 20,000 people involved in this community in on the edge of this big city and what was wonderful was already then a lot of them were very interested also in food as this primary fundamental economic aspect and they had already sent a lot of the children in the alternative school to the country to learn about farming and so on but now they've actually also have their own farm and some of the community has moved out into a the sort of eco community so that you know that's in a way a wonderful model because really what we do want is to be able to start seeing some of these giant cities shrinking rather than inadvertently supporting this globalizing path where these cities are just going to grow and grow and grow because all the jobs are concentrated in those big cities the house prices are astronomical and that's in beijing it's in delhi it's all around the world putting enormous pressure on young people, leading to epidemics of depression, anxiety, and suicide among young people. So this deadly part, it's all linked to, to the urbanization and the decentralization that's happening through self-organized groups of people just coming together and doing it is so inspirational. But definitely, we want to see changes in policy. We absolutely want to see that, but where I think people make a mistake is to think if we just get you know, Scotland away from the UK or if the UK just breaks off from the European Union or Tyrol breaks off from Northern Italy, then we'll have more power over our lives. We won't if we are dependent on this global financial and corporate system. Everything we eat and everything we do is completely dependent on those centralized structures, we have no real power. So it's this gradual process of creating real independence while through big picture activism, lobbying for the, the political structures to listen to voters who are far more economically literate. I, I like to talk about this eco-literate because we need economic literacy, meaning understanding the basic economic structures. And they are fundamentally about either more global, bigger, more monolithic, more monocultural, faster, urban, and on the other side, diversity slowing down, smaller scale, and more, more ecological. But we need also deep ecological literacy to understand why localization is essential because localization is fundamentally about restoring biodiversity. And in order to do that, we need smaller businesses with more people to actually be connected to, to the land. And um, yeah, I, I hope that makes sense. Um, but, and as I said before, in terms of policy change, the, the awareness that in some ways happens more naturally from local government is leading to some change, but most of it is because of lobbying from the bottom up. So, yeah, Alvin. I was just going to say, Helena, maybe now is a good time we move on to the part where we were going to ask people of examples of their communities coming together during this time during the coronavirus pandemic and obviously other examples of localization happening around them that they may be part of or that has inspired them um so if you're happy to do that absolutely okay so if anyone has any examples i think the best thing to do is if you raise your hand in the chat not in real life because i can't see it um and then i can select you to join the conversation and chat just wait and see. Okay, Joel, I'll allow you to speak. Um, and Michael, I'll also allow you. 
um, then hopefully you can all chat. I think you might be on mute, so you may need to, I can unmute you, but you need to accept my request to do so. Hello. Hi, Joel. Hi, how are you doing? Uh, if, if we're giving examples, I, I wanted to share something that I, I find really exciting. Uh, I don't know if anyone's heard about local food nodes, which is basically it's it's starting in Sweden and they they did consultation for years with farmers and consumers who wanted to eat more locally and to connect. And basically they found that a lot of the systems had middlemen in there. So there's a lot of veggie box schemes, but then they're, they're always taking a cut in the middle. Or there's other apps, but then they're always charging the, the farmers or the producers to join in. But then that takes away from their margins, which are already quite low. So what this app does is actually it's paid for by the users as a donation. Um, it was crowdfunded um, hundreds of thousands of euros to get built. And now that they're going ahead with it. It's all it's all going online and it's really exciting. And basically anyone can set up a, a get together with other farmers and set up a node. And then that could be a parking lot or something like that. And that's where all the producers, all the consumers can then pre-order all the produce. And basically it's kind of like a farmer's market, except it goes for only about half an hour and you, everything's already prepaid for. So it's efficient for time on, on both sides of it. Um, it's called local food nodes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I think I have heard of that. And there's, I think, yeah, there are other apps a bit similar to that. And I would, I would also like to say though that generally the farmers markets for even for the farmers can be really enjoyable, but it doesn't always work. You know, we've got to, be aware that it, it, it varies. And I think combination of different mechanisms are needed because we really should be moving towards something like 80% of the food we consume coming from the region. And in most places now, it's probably more like 4%. So uh, it's, a, it's a major shift that's gonna need lots of different mechanisms and, and many different avenues to make it really viable. Michael, would you like to join? Sure. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Um, yeah, look, uh, thanks, Helena. This is fantastic. I've just come from a meeting with um, a, a veteran permaculturalist uh, who's working here at Crystal Waters in Queensland, and he's setting up the Centre of Advanced Permaculture. And... Uh, the plans that he's got for uh, creating lots of opportunities for people to participate and learn and create food practically and um, do all of that. It's very, very exciting. And um, through what I'm doing, which is uh, a global magazine called Eco Village Voice, um, I'll be promoting him and creating videos uh, to disseminate a lot of this information and create training courses uh, for people to follow a model that works, that, you know, he's tried and true, uh, tried and tested uh, kinds of models through his work overseas in um, creating or recreating villages or resurrecting villages that have suffered through natural disasters. And, um, yeah, he's, he's been doing that for many years. I'll, I'll put the link in here uh, and there's a sample magazine where you can um, go and I, I'd love to talk to you further too. Um, about What's his name? I think I know him. Steve Cran. Oh, no, no. Okay, because do you know the older guy at Crystal Waters who's been doing a lot of eco-village work on permaculture, originally from Switzerland? Max Lind yeah, Max Lindiger. Yeah. And we've, we've also got Maura Gamble here, yes, who's very, right. very active as well. Yeah. I know Maura very well too. So both Max and Maura mm. have been probably 30 years. Well, certainly Max. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. And what Steve's doing, sorry, what Steve's doing uh, with the Centre of Advanced Permaculture as a, uh, well, it's, it's a, a farm, but it's also a school, starts to see the vision that Max and the various in individuals who founded Crystal Waters come into being. And, uh, you know, I've talked to Max quite a bit of, and he's very disappointed that the use of the land didn't actually come about the way that, that they were all hoping. But yeah. right now, with a bit of leadership and willing people to come together to create lots of food, uh, it, it's, yeah, a really exciting time. Yeah. I mean, again, I just so hope that people will look at the sort of the structures of, you know, how we both need to do it and lobby for policy change because, uh, you know, so most farmers and growers are operating in this world where, you know, the most important thing we produce is food and the other most important thing we do is parenting. And both mothers and farmers have just been left behind and, you know, not valued, not seen, and oh, we just need this big transformation. Yeah, sure. Uh, Rabina, I don't know if you would like to also join in. I've made it, I saw your hand was raised. Oh, thanks. Um, I didn't deliberately raise my hand. Uh, <laughs> However, just pertaining to the times we're in, um, both the demise and the opportunity, um, I work with permaculture as well on a national and international level. And right now, I'm working much more on the local level. And I'm on the Permaculture Council New Zealand. And um, around the country, um, people who are my colleagues, friends, associates are like looking around about where are the gaps and the seeds, who's got what seeds, um, who's in need. We're not just thinking about our own backyards, our own gardens, but we're thinking about our localities. Um, like for example, here in Golden Bay, where I live at the top of the South Island, before our lockdown, um, we, a few days beforehand, there was seeds and seedlings totally sold out also um, over the hill in Motueka and around the country and understand from listening to David Holmgren's um, launch of Retro Suburbia last night, what Costa was saying, it's similar in Australia as well. So this is our autumn. It's um, a slower growing time, but it's still a growing time. And it's kind of an informal assessment of where are the gaps and who's got plenty and particularly we're in a garlic um a garlic uh search right now and so bubbling up from these grassroots is this um out of the need is just really starting to take off um this local linking and through our permaculture network um, we have these bioregional con uh, contacts that we're now trying to strengthen and, and doing this distribution and need assessment through that. I think I'll leave it at there as like an example of a response of the times. Yeah, it's well, exciting. Thank you so much for your work also, Rubina, and, of course, and for mentioning David, who I, I just think has also been a fabulous uh, voice and actor in the permaculture movement. <laughs> And we've also got Wendy. I'm unmuted, so we should be able to hear you. Well, there's also Christian who raises hand muted. Oh, hello, Wendy. Yes. <laughs> can you hear me? I yes. can hear you. Can Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, Helena and everybody. I think you would like to know of uh, the small but I think significant changes that we've seen here on your doorstep when you're in England um, yeah. just in the last two weeks that yeah. the local biodynamic farm has doubled it, uh, the, the demand for the food that it uh, sends out in its veg boxes 
has yes. doubled over two weeks because they've made yes. links with lots of the local uh, farmers to be able to uh, provide what people are asking for and brought in more people to help on the farm to deliver the boxes. And when I cycled around this countryside yesterday, through mostly around here, empty pasture land, and actually no sheep, no cows out and about, just seeing this farm with heaps of people down there sowing the seeds and uh, tending the earth was so lovely to see. Uh, it's a tiny thing, but I guess it's happening, I hope, all over the world in response to this pandemic. Uh, yeah. That and also in this town, the town council, the um, local charity, you know, the Chutnes Caring, coming together to provide a really rich network of support for everybody who can't get out of the house. Or... So I just wanted to tell you that that tiny thing happening here as perhaps an example of a very rapid and noticeable response to, to this crisis. Yeah, it's wonderful to hear that. And I, I, you know, as you know, that farm is right on our doorstep in England. And yeah, it's wonderful. And it is happening around the world, particularly in those what I would call localization hotspots, where people had already started realizing how much they value connection to nature and to community and how, how they were starting to basically build the community economy or the local economy. And in those hotspots, it's really very, very inspiring. But, but not only there, it is all over the world. Yeah. I'm based in Bristol in the UK, and um, every veg box supplier, whether it's a farmer or a local person who's connecting the farms and delivering the veg boxes, is now just completely full. They can't take on any more people. Um, the farms are working like crazy. Um, and it's just, yeah, amazing to see. And it's all kind of organic focused as well, which is incredible. So I was wondering if any people have any kind of more international examples of responses like that to this pandemic, feel free to raise your hand. I think maybe everyone who wanted to chat has, oh, no, there's a few more I see, okay. Abby? I think. Hello. I'm sorry, this is slightly off topic, but I cannot resist the um, opportunity. Um, locally, um, we're fumbling along as best we can, but I am in uh, contact with a young woman from Ladakh, who of course cannot join this webinar. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you don't need me to tell you, Helena, yeah. that um, they have, they know exact, they know exactly how to survive on this planet um, in small communities. So in terms of that, um, they're okay in the villages. But this young woman, she lives in Malak, and she works in the tourism industry. Yeah. And I told her this morning that I've given up flying because of global warming. So she's asking my advice about what she should do. And I don't feel qualified to answer that question. And I would like to say, work on the farm. That's what I would like to say. But these are very young people who are being opened up to new influences. Yes. So I wondered if you well, could give me some advice yes, about what definitely. to say. Definitely. Uh, I would love to put her in touch with that. I, I don't know who you're talking about. But I'd love to put her in touch with the new networks of young Ladakhis who are actually wanting to go back to the land and who are very much involved with our work. And it's been for us very inspiring that there are now quite a lot of young people who from having experienced life in New Delhi and in the big city have developed a real deep appreciation for what their traditional culture and economy had to offer. And they, you know, like, like with us, they're not trying to say we want to go back to exactly the way it was, but they certainly understand that they need to keep 
the basic food production alive in Ladakh. So if you email us, we could, or, or her, or whatever, we could put you in touch with some of those other Ladakhis whom she may not know. And so at least she could join some of those groups and networks where they are discussing exactly these issues. And, and there, as in many parts of the world, because the entire system is using money to encourage urbanization. It's not always easy to earn a living right away in, in going against the grain, but uh, there, are, there are definitely new initiatives being set up and at least she can feel connected to others who, who see these issues. Yes, I gave some individual names, so, but yes, I would be very interested to see those links. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, if anybody... <laughs> Sorry, Abby, carry on. No, 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 I was only going to be a total sycophant. I uh, would say that you changed my life. Thank you very much. Because oh, you're, you're one of the reasons why I went there in the first place. Oh, thank you. Well, I hope but then I regretted it in a way because I shouldn't have been on that aeroplane, should I? Oh, I'm not so sure. <laughs> it changed your life and if you... Yeah, it's, a, it's another longer story, but I've actually been rather worried about people who are, you know, until this crisis, and even now, I don't know what's happening in this insane trade system where we know that fish was being flown to China to be deboned and flown back again, and scallops from Tasmania to China to be open and flown back, and nuts from right here flown to China to be cracked open, flown back again. We don't hear anything about what's actually happened to that. What we do hear now is that Britain wants to import 30,000 migrant workers to pick the fruits and vegetables because they're locked into this absolute insanity of this trading system, which now not only includes exporting uh, half the food and importing identical, but importing the migrant labor. I mean, it's just this dislocation, disconnection, the long distances all the time, an extractive capitalism that is creating this world of a few billionaires and, and these mega corporations. It's just crazy. So I really feel that people like you and many people who are actually ecologically and culturally sensitive and concerned and who would like to both learn and try to spread the word about another way. I, I worry that they don't travel. Whereas until, you know, before COVID, you know, the proponents of mass tourism, the proponents of consumerism were traveling more than ever. So it's something to really think about. Um, it, it'd be fine if all of that unnecessary flying, including the food back and forth, stopped. The world would be a lot better off. But if we, who care, stop flying and, and uh, you know, as I say, those who are employed to promote consumerism continue to travel. That's a real problem. Yeah. Yeah. Julie. 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 Mm. I just want to read out something that Nicole's put in the chat box, which is a nice example of localization in practice. So demand for local food has spiked in Alaska these last few weeks. Of course, it's still too cold for new crops to be ready, but all the potatoes, carrots, beets remaining from the last four in, in huge demand. I work for an organization in coordination with others to spread the word about the coronavirus resources and safety protocols for farmers and to spread the word about local farming to the public. We're hoping this pandemic will actually be a catalyst for us to grow the local food movement here. It's been growing this last decade and we have 30% raise in new farms in the last six years. This could be the push to encourage the general public to view buying local food as normal. Well, it's, we're certainly seeing such an appetite for local food. And, and again, that knowledge which we've been trying to talk about, uh, about the more accountability, visibility, reliability. And I, I think people are uh, having this huge wake up call now about the vulnerability and the the big problems with being dependent on these global systems. So, so hoping that now people will be taking some time again to really be more economically literate. Don't leave it to experts. Don't believe that this economic system is somehow so big and so amorphous and 
that it's not, just not possible to change it. We really believe that the biggest obstacle is the lack of understanding of the components, the structures of the global power. The fact that our taxes, all, you know, the subsidies, really all of them, and the regulations have been supporting monopolies. And the biggest frightening thing there is the monopolistic control of who actually fabricates money. You know, giant banks fabricating this as debt to government. Right now, those giants are working with governments to push through money to the bottom as debt. This is not a solution. This is not creating healthy economies. This is a, a, a temporary, maybe, let's see now where that money lands. Most of the money is actually propping up giant corporations. But let's pray that some of those crumbs do fall to the bottom and that individuals and small businesses don't collapse. But what we really need is for people to wake up to the fact that this is something that we should be voting about, it's something we should be speaking about. It is not being discussed in any meaningful, holistic way. So please don't believe that most people know all this and that we don't need to talk about it, there's no need for it. It's not true. The structures, the actual structures that are not that complicated, and the same way the structures that can take us towards genuine human scale, accountable, more democratic, more just, genuinely more ecological ways, the structural path lies in a systemic shift towards localizing. We could use other language maybe, but I myself find the message that all around the world, it should be a human right to have fresh, nutritious food available from the region. And that should be considered an economic priority. That food and, and of course not the water should not be owned by foreign corporations. That I believe is an agenda that most people could get behind. And, and remember, it's so important that it comes from a global perspective. It's not some kind of narrow nationalism where we're somehow just going to look after ourselves. No, this is a responsibility. It's a big shift. It's not an easy shift, but it's a shift that will be a far, far easier shift than to continue down now the path towards robots and Elon Musk's thinking of going off to Mars to find more minerals and resources and dump a polluted Earth. We need to become mature. We need to hear more voices from women who are generally more grounded. They're less caught up in this techno-economic fantasy world. Um, and it's, you know, it's a question of also recognizing that as we become closer to the life that sustains us, as we see that there is a part that is more genuinely collaborative in human terms, but the interdependence means that what's good for the group is good for me. We are actually creating a structure that's more peaceful. It's not a guarantee for peace, it's not a guarantee for democracy, but it's a prerequisite. And so the key thing that happens there too that is so profoundly important is that as we are closer to the life on which we depend, we become more humble. We move away from what is a collective hubris. It's a collective hubris because we're always specialized, isolated from and dependent on, on information and statistics from afar. When we are closer to the reality of that water, of that tree, of that human being, we understand the infinite complexity of life. We understand how little we really know. We understand that we cannot control and hold still and manage life as this patriarchal system that has developed over 500 years has been based on the idea that everything works like a machine, it's separate from everything else, we can control it, we can hold still, and we're gonna pump in you know, lots of energy now to make this thing go even faster. And unfortunately, even in the Green New Deal, 
there is too little discussion of decentralization, localization, and a lot of it is coming from vested interests that think they're going to prop up the global insane trade and the global insanity with multiple renewable energy systems, plastering the Sahara with solar panels, plastering ground. I don't want to see any solar panel on any bit of ground. Every bit of ground is holy. Every bit of ground should be thriving with life. Don't put solar panels on that ground. You know, you may be helping it to remain wild. Wonderful. You may make it productive. You may help it to, to hold the water and to be part of that magical relationship that keeps life going. But don't plaster it with solar panels. I think there's a lot that we have to think of, you know. I mean, I, I don't want to say a lot to think about because that. I think there are some basic principles here. And, and there is a middle path. This is not saying we've got to go back to, you know, every single one of us grow our own food, every single one of us become, you know, native. In a certain way, we all need to become native in the sense of belonging to place. But that's not a prison. It doesn't mean we can't travel. It doesn't mean that we couldn't explore other cultures. The amazing thing is that as we really nourish life, we nourish diversity, we so enrich places, we don't have to travel very far to find something other. And sorry for this final lecture, but I just want to say too that the amazing thing that I saw way back in early Ladakh is also that that richness of diversity start with genuine, authentic individualism, where we have created a way to live where a child feels seen and heard and accepted as they are. And I, I just want to say too that partly that was to do with worldview, which accepted life as it is. They were not caught up with this view of progress where now parents you know, are frightened before children are even born, that they're not going to get into the right school, they're not going to succeed. It's all part of a view of progress that you know, starts with original sin and the idea that you know, everything is imperfect and our bodies are dirty and sinful, and we've got to be on this path of purification and progress. No, this is about a deep acceptance of the complexity and richness of life which most indigenous cultures can teach us about and most spiritual traditions have at, at their heart. So I think, I think it's probably... <laughs> we just added um, yeah. a couple others to speak if we've got okay. five minutes left. Yeah. Oh, hey. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Hi, Elena, this is Cyprian. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I'm following everything that's happening in response to, to the crisis. I'm trying to look at what's happening in different countries. And of course, one of the one I'm the most aware of is, is France. And in France at the moment, um, it sparked the debate really deeply. So um, you can see on mainstream media, this debate happening, are we going to go towards a technocratic society, uh, super centralized, controlled by big corporation, or are we going to go towards decentralization, slowing down and decroissance, as it's called in France. Yeah. It's all over the French news. Uh, movements are producing this, this, this video asking, you, you were talking about how the governments are printing heaps of money at the moment uh, with infinite quantitative easing. And in France, uh, these permaculture movements have produced this, this video that's asking the president, because now they're producing so much money, to invest it in a whole bunch of micro farms. Uh -huh. And uh, France, you're talking about lobbying works in that case, but France has been like in a case of almost civil war for two years with the yellow jackets yeah. Yeah. and still not managing to push the government to go in that direction. No. No, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, but Cyprian, it's also very exciting to hear that that deeper discussion is in the mainstream news. I wish you would, if you could spend a bit of time writing about that or getting things out in the English speaking world. Because just as with the Five Star Movement in Italy, where they managed to achieve quite a lot, I felt that more international support and building up a broader international movement 
is a very important part of it. Uh, and it's, it's really, you know, most people have no idea that that level of discussion is going on in France. I didn't even know that, that that's in the There's mainstream. a lot, yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and what you're saying is it's not enough. No, it's not enough, and especially not in isolation. And there is a way in which the mainstream media and the mainstream narrative manages to keep that inside the nation state's walls so that we don't get more support and more nourishment also from outside help. So please help to try to make that more visible and also yeah, be in touch so we can talk more separately. I really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. And yeah, tomorrow morning I'm interviewing the founder of uh, Democracy Earth. And it'll be very interesting because what they're doing is they're trying to override democratic institutions through, of course, electronic systems. But I'll bring in your view and say that Elena that I interviewed had this, uh, um, worries about an electronic system. Yeah, I'm also very worried about the idea of global government. Please keep in mind that we're talking then about our tiny voice being one of eight billion. It's what we need is international collaboration, but let's not forge units even bigger than the nation state. I mean, within the EU, all right, if you're already in there, but really not a good idea to try to move towards global government. And it's, it, it, yeah, anyway, not too much I'll, to talk about this later. I'll send you a, an email about yeah. all of this. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I've put my email in the chat a few times. So if you send that, I can forward it over to Helena. All right. Um, and the last person that was added was Sherry. Um, yes. Yes, hello. How are you? Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing uh, everything, Helena. I just adore everything that you're sharing. Um, I'd just like to mention here in Byron Bay, over the last probably two, three, four weeks, mm -hmm. There's just been an amaz amazing collaboration of people uh, connecting, planting, guerrilla planting, connecting for seeds and so forth as well. People that I would never have thought would have been uh, the least bit um, inclined to head that way. They are. And it's a beautiful community, but not only just for the planting, yeah. but yeah. energetically. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And yeah, thank you for sharing everything. Greatly appreciated. Thank you. Okay, so that's two minutes to go. I've mentioned in the chat box a few times that if we haven't managed to answer your questions during this, what I'll try and do is film Helena talking through the answers and we'll post them in the IAL Facebook group, which you'll be invited to once you, if you sign up on our website. Um, why don't we ask people if they do have questions still to send them to us again by email? Yes, yeah, so I've added my email in the chat box. So if you feel like your question wasn't answered and you desperately want an answer, please email me. Um, I'll post my email again. Let's just see it. Um, and yeah, we really I love to I, I think, Laura, what I'd like to promise is that if your question wasn't answered, or comment. I'm happy to take critical comments as well. You know, if you feel, I think I noticed quite a few people getting off when I was talking about the extended family and versus the nuclear family. And, and if any of you are still there, you know, if you feel that that's too extreme or whatever, I'd love to hear that. Because there are certain aspects of this that may sound too extreme for most Westerners. So I think uh, any comments you have, either critical or helpful, we very much appreciate. Any questions, and we may or may not film me. I can end up much more wordy when I speak. So we'll either respond in writing or, or perhaps film. That's what I would say. Okay. So yeah, we'd love to carry on the discussion via the IAL list service and Facebook groups. And we'll You'll be back to your lovely face, Laura, before you go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's getting and back, I think. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank and you so much for everything. Still there. And yeah, thank you so much, Laura. And, and yeah, I'd you like. You would have been online if you did that. Sorry? Oh. I'd like to encourage people also to sign up for our email update if they haven't already. 
And to join the IAL, you mentioned that at the beginning, then you uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else? No, I think that was everything. And um, so, yeah, hopefully chat with you all soon via IAL email and we'll keep in touch. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank Thanks, you. everyone.